Thank you very much. So um, I'll introduce myself, uh, Alan Ware. I'm one of the co-conveners of this Impact Coalition on Just Institutions and the International Court of Justice, along with Rebecca Shute and Nishan Gunasekara, who will introduce themselves soon. Um, you also see a couple of other people who are on screen, or they're not, they're not visible on screen at the moment, but you see their names there, Drea Bergman and James May, who are helping uh, run the technical side and making sure everything runs smoothly from Citizens for Global Solutions. So thank you, Drea and James, for your technical support to make sure that we have a smooth meeting today. Uh, so just a little bit about myself and my involvement in this Impact Coalition. Uh, I'm the Program Director for World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, uh, and also I'm Program Director of the Peace and Disarmament Program of the World Future Council, um, and they are two of the organisations that have established both Law Not War, Legal Alternatives to War, which is focused very much on the International Court of Justice, and then fed into the establishment of this impact coalition, which is broader than just the International Court of Justice. It's looking at regional and international judicial institutions. Uh, and, uh, the, and the Impact Coalition, which we'll say a little bit more about soon, uh, was formed at the uh, Nairobi UN Civil Society Conference. Uh, and I'm also involved as a global coordinator of parliamentarians for nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, so very much engaged in the nuclear disarmament issue as well as in uh, judicial institutions. So that's myself. I'll pass on to Rebecca Schutt to introduce herself. <clears throat> Thank you, Alan. And may I say I'm delighted by this turnout and seeing so many um, familiar names and hopefully uh, later on faces, as well as a lot of newcomers um, who I'm looking forward to meeting. Um, my name is Rebecca Shute. I'm the Executive Director of Citizens for Global Solutions. Uh, CGS is the U.S. member organization of the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy. We've been around since 1947 and working on international justice issues throughout that trajectory over the decades. I'm also the co-convener of the Washington Working Group for the International Criminal Court, and I've previously served at the ICC in the Office of the Presidency with a dual role in chambers um, and uh, a diplomatic role focused on the universality of the Rome Statute. Um, I also previously directed the uh, International Law and Human Rights Program of Parliamentarians for Global Action dedicated to universality and effectiveness of international judicial institutions. So with that, I'll pass it to my friend Neshan. Thank you, Rebecca Allen. Uh, good evening to everybody connecting from Lund, South of Sweden. I'm Neshan Gunasekar. I'm a lawyer from Sri Lanka and currently based at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. Uh, it's a great privilege to connect again uh, with some of you and meet some of the new friends who've joined us today. I'm also uh, co-chair of the Peace and Disarmament Commission of the World Future Council alongside Alan and happen to work uh, with Alan and others very closely and the link to this conversation through my uh, close work with late Judge Christopher Vira Mantri, who was a former judge of the International Court of Justice. So great pleasure to be here. Look forward to our dialogue. Uh, so thank you, Rebecca and Nisha. Now, if we had two hours for this event, we would also be able to go around and everyone would be able to introduce themselves one by one. Uh, but we don't have that amount of time today. So what we'd like to ask you to do is just to include in the chat, I believe that it's been enabled so everybody can write into the chat. Uh, just, uh, you know, like your, your organization, perhaps where you're from, the organization that you're associated with, if you're associated with an organization, um, and maybe a brief sentence about why you've joined the Impact Coalition or what you might like to see from the Impact Coalition. Um, and as we're going through, we'll make sure that we read what's in the chat. But also when it comes to our times when you may want to ask a question or make a comment, we'll also ask you uh, when you do that verbally to introduce yourself verbally. Okay, so um, we're going to now just show you the, uh, the agenda for the meeting today. I was wondering if Drea, you can um, start the slideshow so we can show the agenda on the screen. Um, I will go quickly over what the agenda is for this meeting and then we'll start with the first agenda item. Uh, Drea, are you able to? Oh, yeah, James is thanks. sharing today. Okay, thank you, James. So we'll just go through to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, so we've just done introductions to ourselves, and hopefully you're now putting introductions to yourselves in the chat box. 
Uh, we're going to have a quick overview of the background and the objectives of this coalition, starting with firstly, what are the impact coalitions? And then what is this uh, coalition? Um, and we'll also have a look at maybe, you know, whether we might be interested in changing the name, because we were given this name um, from the UN Civil Society Conference, and we're not too sure if it's totally accurate. So we'll raise that also as part of there. Then you should have all received the provisional work plan for the Impact Coalition. Uh, but if you haven't had a chance to read it, and we hope you have, but if you haven't, don't, don't fret. We will be showing the main points of the provisional work plan on the screen when it comes to introducing that. And then we're really interested in your feedback. So the work plan is outlined sort of the way that we're operating, what are like the core objectives, what are the principles, uh, but also some of what we hope to do over the months between now and September in particular, which is the UN Summit of the Future, and then how we might, a few ideas about how we might then move on after September, because we, we're not looking at finishing in September. Uh, so we're very interested in your ideas and thoughts on that. Then we'll also look at what, what can help us with the work that we're doing as part of the Impact Coalition. What some of the specific advocacy uh, goals, proposals, including some of those that have been put into the People's Pact for the Future, which is the civil society, the advocacy tool that's been built uh, through a, over a year of consultations amongst a broad variety of civil society organizations. That, of course, is feeding into uh, and we'll explain this a little bit more, the, the pact for the future, which the governments are going to be adopting uh, at the summit of the future, and the declaration on future generations. So what's a, what, what will be helpful for us, and not just us as the, the conveners of the coalition, but for you, the participants in the coalition, what types of resources will be helpful for doing that? Uh, how in-depth, we've got sort of a range of those, and we'll say what, what we're planning, what we're coming up with at the moment. And then also, what are some of the actions that your organisation or networks might be doing that's related to the Impact Coalition? Uh, and through that, we'll come up with some ideas of possible collaboration and how we'll be able to keep that communication and collaboration going. So that's an outline of what we hope to do over the hour or so that we're together. Um, I will now pass on to Rebecca, I think, who's going to introduce the Impact Coalition. It's what they are. Uh, thank you so much, Alan. I think we need to skip a couple of slides here and um, move uh, toward the Impact Coalition slide, which is the next one. So to take a step back um, before explaining what the Impact Coalitions are, um, I think it's uh, perhaps helpful to have a refresher for many of us of the Summit of the Future process and how that came to be, its, um, uh, its germination. And I'm mindful that there are many on this call who are far more cognizant and have been very close to this process um, in their UN work. Um, coming out of the um, new agenda for peace, Secretary General Antonio Guterres um, uh, envisioned a summit of the future that would be what has been hailed as a once in a generation opportunity for seismic UN reform. Originally to be held last year uh, in tandem with the SDG summit, it was ultimately decoupled and will be held this September um, in New York and in a way, I think that um, behooved the uh, summit of the future process. And one of those auxiliary outcomes of that timing shift was allowing civil society a chance over the, uh, the period of this year um, to play a role in what hopefully will be a multilateral, multi-sectoral attempt at true UN reform. I think we're all familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals and the Millennium Development Goals that preceded them. And this is a new, uh, uh, newly fashioned mechanism, a different way to conceptualize reform, change, and progress at the UN um, across an array um, of topical areas, and basically everything you can think of in terms of governance. And so our dear friends at the Coalition for the UN We Need, I hope some of them are with us today or might see this later, um, did the yo person's work of convening a civil society conference in Nairobi that Alan has mentioned at the outset back in May. And in conceptualizing what would this uh, conference look like, they thought about pact and impact. So one of the key outcomes, um, Alan, I think also briefly mentioned this, of the pact of the summit of the future will be a pact for the future. 
It's accompanied by two other documents, a global digital compact and a declaration on future generations um, that perhaps my colleague Nashan would like to speak a little bit more to as well. And these are obviously all mutually informing one another um, and uh, intersectoral. Um, so day one of the Civil Society Conference focused on the five chapters of the pact. And uh, we now, as of this morning, have the People's Pact ready to be disseminated that we can share in the chat here uh, that Alan mentioned. The structure of the People's Pact um, mirrors the Pact for the Future um, with five chapters. Um, uh, and they are uh, focused on the financial architecture for uh, to support um, UN the P, uh, peace, chapter on peace and security, a chapter on uh, the digital and technological uh, considerations, um, a chapter on um, future generations, and a chapter on global governance reform. And Alan and I, with Nashan, have um, been working, uh, had been working on the peace and security chapter, and Nashan also in the chapter on future generations. Um, so we're very happy to now share the fruits of that labor with you. And so the second day of this conference introduced a new modality of participation, these impact coalitions. And these were seen as hopefully the aspiration of a truly civil society generated, diverse stakeholder constituted process uh, to work with states and others uh, to advance key reform initiatives leading up to and beyond the summit of the future. And these coalitions came to Nairobi um, in a variety um, of levels of maturation. Some of them um, newly formed, embryonic. Some of them had already been working in various, um, perhaps not in, uh, not constituted in that form, but uh, in various means and methods, uh, and then everything in between. They also have different lifespans or anticipated lifespans. Some of these coalitions are intended really to work up to the summit and the summit only. And some, such as what we hope uh, will be the case here with what is currently called Just Institutions and the International Court of Justice, we hope will live beyond. Um, and so when we get to our work plan, you will see the short, medium, and long-term goals. I also want to say that it's incredibly important to us that these coalitions be mutually reinforcing, um, that they are collaborative with one another and with existing mechanisms. And so, of course, for us, this includes the Coalition for the International Criminal Court. And I have to apologize for many of my dear friends within the CICC community who are in The Hague this week with the NGO roundtables um, and so have not been able to attend the session, but I'm sure they, there will be outreach there as well as coalitions that are supporting uh, new or imagined, envisioned um, judicial institutions. I'm very pleased to see my colleague, David Gallup on the line, um, who uh, leads a World Court of Human Rights Coalition. And uh, we also work with the um, founders uh, and implementers of the International Anti-Corruption Court. Um, and these are just the judicial coalitions um, and uh, civil society organizations with which we and networks with which we work. We also see the um, absolute um, essential uh, need to work with coalitions focused on, for example, the rights of future generations on earth governance, on any host of issues that um, the uh, international legal system could be seized up to contemplate. Um, also, peace and security obviously is uh, imminently important to this whole enterprise. Um, so I think I will stop there on the explanation of what impact coalitions are, and I'm very happy to try to take any questions before we all get into what we hope this coalition can accomplish and its backgrounds and objectives. Um, before we maybe go to the floor for questions, if any of my, if Neshan or Alan, um, my co-conspirators want to um, add or correct anything that I've put in the record. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for outlining the um, role and uh, objectives of the impact coalitions um, and starting the conversation on the judicial institutions. Um, I just want to give the opportunity for Nishan to say a little bit more about the judicial institutions, um, and maybe we can go to the next slide because we have the key ones uh, um, up on screen with the next slide. Uh, and this will just give it a little bit more of the substance of what the judicial institutions are and the role they play before we go into the work plan. So Nishan, would you like to give a bit of an overview on this? Sure, Alan, thank you. Uh, and uh, for Rebecca setting the context, uh, I think at the very outset uh, to possibly repeat myself uh, for those who are in Nairobi, 
is to reiterate that uh, it's 125 years since the first Hague Peace Conference, which established the first international tribunal for the peaceful settlement of disputes, which is the permanent court of arbitration, uh, which was one of the key outcomes of the 1899 Peace Conference at The Hague. So uh, it's uh, quite an interesting uh, passage of time, this 125 years since that time, which paved the way for the League of Nations and the Permanent Court of International Justice, and now the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, uh, at the international level, and of course, various other institutions, ad hoc institutions, and regional tribunals and courts as well. So whilst there's been possibly almost you know 3,000 years of judicial adjudication at the local or what we call the national level loosely today, the international adjudication has really uh, been spearheaded during the last 125 years. So this coalition really focuses on uh, the wider kind of the collaboration between these institutions, but a specific look at the International Court of Justice, its jurisdiction, and the International Criminal Court. Uh, remembering that there is an interplay between these separate institutions at the international governance level, whether it's at the multilateral level and at the regional level, when we look at uh, how the International Court of Justice or the International Criminal Court has its uh, counterplay in the European Court of Human Rights or the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and so forth. So this is a brief overview. Uh, there are many others who are well versed on this subject, but I'm happy to dig deeper as the dialogue opens up, Alan. So thank you. Over. Thank you very much, Rebecca and Nishan. The next section we're going on is to actually look at the work plan. But before that, if anyone has any comments or questions that they want to raise about you know, the institutions and the role of the institutions, we have an opportunity to do that now. Um, Rebecca, you wanted to add a little bit more. Yes, um, I think it's important to um, also contextualize why this coalition is important and what its overarching aims um, seek uh, to accomplish. Um, and that is to promote both the universality and the effectiveness of these institutions, as well as um, uh, earlier mentioned, uh, potentially contemplating new institutions. And I think we understand perhaps those in the room who are friends of international justice, why that is never more important than it is today, when we see courts and the brave individuals who work for them um, as uh, within uh, as judges, as prosecutors, um, as members of secretariats and registries um, under attack. Um, it can never be acceptable to uh, threaten the independence and integrity of a judicial institution. And it certainly is unacceptable to um, raise the specter of sanctions. I mentioned at the outset that I'm the co-convener of the Washington Working Group for the ICC. So this is, of course, an issue that we are highly um, seized of at the moment. And I see some of my friends who, who regularly join us on the call as well. Um, we hope with this coalition to also push for the greater effectiveness of these institutions. Um, while we uh, support wholeheartedly their existence um, and their necessary role within a global governance framework, we also realize that there are areas that they could be improved um, in terms of efficiency, in terms of transparency, um, uh, in, in terms of procedural matters and in terms of substantive matters. And so much as the coalition for the ICC continues, including notably this week, uh, to work with that institution to help it uh, continue to realize its mandate to its fullest potential uh, and continue to improve and enhance its working methods. And we hope that this coalition will have an opportunity to do the same across an array of institutions. Um, so forgive me my, my soapbox moment, um, but I thought that was important to, to bear in mind. Well, thank you, Rebecca. You've segued into the start of the work plan. So I'll ask James to shift to the next slide. Um, Sorry, have Rebecca. have hand raised, um, Emma um, Osan. And it's so great to see you here, Emma. Oh, sorry, that was just a welcome, was it, Rebecca? Oh, Emma. Sorry, Emma. Emma's going to say something. Yes. yes. Uh, Emma, if you unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, I wasn't sure if I was being heard. So on the previous slide, uh, I'm new to this. So pardon the question if it's really um, out of context or out of place. Yes, on the slide. 
my my question and clarification perhaps someone can help me understand is 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 the um the institutions mainly um so, so let me rephrase that is there representation from the global south because what i see here appears to be tilted in terms of the institutions that are playing some role in the global governance structure of the future, if that's where this is heading, seem tilted mainly to perhaps um, establish organizations that are in the global north, if I could use that phrase. And, and again, um, I must say that I'm coming to this new, though very interested. And so the question may be completely out of context or out of place. So. Uh, if that can be clarified, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, thanks, Emma. And it's a totally appropriate question. It's actually really good to understand how these courts work, um, because that's an important part of recognising are they able to contribute uh, to uh, justice and uh, the issues which they're dealing with or, or not. So, um, Nishan, do you want to start off on this one with having a look at the, in a sense, a bit of an overview of the composition of the courts uh, regional and the international institutions, just to demonstrate their, comp their composition uh, and their representation. Uh, sure, Alan, I will <clears throat> give it an initial uh, response. Uh, thank you, Emma, for raising this important question. So uh, uh, in the kind of geographic, geographic location of these institutions, you may we just wonder, oh, they're mostly in the global north. But if you look at how they're represented and in their functioning, uh, say, for example, the International Court of Justice, uh, and if you look at uh, the number of judges, the 15 judges uh, that constitute the full bench of the International Court of Justice, they represent uh, the whole uh, members of the United Nations, and there is a representative mechanism of, on, on selecting these judges. And the 22 judges of the International Tribunal of the Law, the Sea, and so forth, that's one aspect. And another aspect is uh, perhaps uh, this question was a really a valid one, um, say another 40, 50 years ago, if you look at the type of cases that were heard by these uh, 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 the tribunals were mostly um, uh, restricted to one or two cases, again, uh, coming from affluent states and so forth. But today, every member of the United Nations are able to go before these institutions. And one quick example of this is uh, currently the International Court of Justice is uh, the beginning a process to hear an advisory opinion on climate change, uh, which was pushed forward by an inspiring effort of young people from the Pacific Island states that moved the whole General, General Assembly last March to get a consensus resolution at that level to ask this important question from the highest UN organ in the world. And as uh, you know, Rebecca briefly mentioned, the other type of cases that have come before uh, these institutions in the last decade or so shows an increasing uh, number of cases uh, that are brought there by smaller states against so-called powerful states and the adjudication has been fair and then in most cases been implemented. So in this case, there are uh, a, quite an interesting number of uh, developments over the, I would say, the last quarter century, which is evolving into what we call a 21st century notion of international law and international criminal jurisprudence. Now, saying that uh, it is not a perfect scenario, there's much to be done, as Rebecca said, uh, to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of these institutions. But we must always guard against uh, the trajectory currently seen by select number of powerful states to discredit these achievements. So I will leave it at there. I'm sure, Rebecca, you also have a few points to add. Over. Uh, thank you, Nishan. Yes, just a, a few additions um, or observations. First is, I think um, we all realize, I hope we all realize that promoting the um, effectiveness of existing institutions means promoting their inclusivity and their representative nature. And this is not just at the judicial level, where, of course, it is most obvious, and um, many of the and the international courts do have um, uh, procedures um, baked into their election systems for the representation from an array of regions. But it's true in every organ in the international um, courts, wherein you often see Global South underrepresented. 
in um, functions, for example, um, uh, within the staff of the court, within the registry, within um, chambers, et cetera, um, as, as clerks. And the second observation that um, I'll make is that we also hope to support um, not only regional institutions, and of course, um, the world is asymmetrical in those regions that are embraced by um, either human rights or um, other forms of judicial systems um, and those that are not. Um, we also hope to work uh, with the um, tribunals, um, both uh, that are intentional, intended for a single country or a single situation, um, and those that may have more lasting, um, uh, uh, more lasting um, uh, long longevity. Um, examples may include, um, and also here I just want to stress the principle of complementarity that is bedrock to this whole enterprise. So looking at example like the Central African Republic, where you have a special criminal court that heard its first case in 2022. You have domestic um, court systems seeking to end impunity, and you have the International Criminal Court all hopefully working in a cohesive way to advance justice and achieve accountability for victims and survivors. And the third point that I'd like to make is where there are newly contemplated judicial institutions, we hope that perhaps some of this imbalance can be rectified. Um, one, uh, the, I think, uh, leading chapter of the International Anti-Corruption Court Initiative is um, on the African continent, and there has been extensive conversation about um, a potential seat for the court um, on the African continent. Um, we would hope also that um, those regions that currently do not have any structures in place um, to, to protect um, human rights or otherwise uh, or in, uh, enforce international criminal law uh, might do so in future, um, looking at the Asia Pacific, for example. And I see we have at least one person who was with us at 1 a.m. my time last night, and I'm pleased to see you again um, from our Asia Pacific call. And this is where I think we stand to benefit from a coalition that is as diverse as can be, and from all of your inputs to help achieve this vision of a more equitable um, and inclusive judi global judicial order. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I hope that helped, Emma. Um, if, if you've got any further questions or comments, please feel free to raise your hand again. Um, I think, yes, Emma, you've thank, got a response. Thank you. It does, it does help. And I, I was wondering if the Africa Court for Peoples and Human Rights is interested or is participating, as that would also help in this um, inclusiveness. Uh, so those are some of the things that jumped out at me when I saw the slide, right? So it's not about always looking at the contours, but uh, how inclusive, as Rebecca has had mentioned. So here I'm also thinking that regional courts or continental bodies that can bring in that um, inclusive approach as we look towards the summit for the future would be good. But then again, uh, having said that, it's possible that they are engaged through other uh, intersections in this coalition. But I'll leave it at that. And thank you so much for the responses. Thank you very much, Emma, for the question and Rebecca and Nisham for responding to that. We're moving on to the provisional work plan. But just before we start going through that, I have a question just to put to you, just to consider, um, and we'll come back to it later on. And that is whether we might look at changing the name. At the moment, it's just institutions. Um, and But what's meant from our side of that is the judicial institutions. But that may not be totally clear. Um, or to be even clearer, maybe we should be call it tribunals and courts. So just thinking, you know, whether the, the, the name Just Institutions and International Court of Justice adequately reflects what we're aiming to do as the Impact Coalition, um, or whether it might be good for us to have a slightly different name. And we, we won't take the discussion now, but we'll go through the work plan first to get a better idea of what we're doing, and then we'll come back and later on, if you've got thoughts and comments on that, then we welcome those comments. So what we're looking now is that the provisional work plan, which we'll go into a little bit more, how we envisage uh, the Impact Coalition working um, and what some of the the, the, the key um, aims, objectives, the principles, and also some of the timeline of events. 
Uh, so maybe we go to the next slide. And I think, is this Rebecca again starting off on this? Or is it Neshan? I can't remember. I think I've spoken to this a little bit already, so I'd love Neshan to, to have his turn. Sure, Rebecca. Um, yes, I think uh, it was kind of covered already kind of purpose of the coalition with the, uh, the institutions mentioned. Uh, but a couple of points um, to highlight here uh, is the role of civil society uh, uh, in engaging in these processes. And I think uh, uh, while Alan asked for a kind of ideas on renaming of just, uh, just institutions, the first point is that, uh, and this was made clear even in, in our discussions in Nairobi, that this process uh, and this journey is not meant only for international lawyers or those of uh, you know, international legal background, but it meant for wider civil society because that's where really the strength is. And a quick anecdote on this is the fact that the 1899 Peace Conference was, you know, first put together, was also inspired by civil society leaders such as Bertha von Sattner, who was not a lawyer uh, and who was a journalist who did inspire that uh, generation of decision makers. And then it is, again, falling on civil society to ensure that we see through this challenging but transitionary period of time in global governance and these institutions that were created really uh, to move away from aggression and forceful ways, including use of war as a dispute of resolution of uh, dispute resolution, and to get into a you know pacific settlement of disputes, and that's been one of the key achievements. Uh, of creating these institutions, and we seem to still not have got it right. And I think this is one of the overarching aims to ensure that uh, the complementarity between these institutions are strengthened further, and uh, through civil society action and inclusiveness uh, is is uh, brought to uh, brought to the front, uh, alongside how uh, this would uh, work through not only the summit of the future this year but also through uh, other developments taking place within the international adjudication processes, including ongoing cases, as well as uh, future cases that are going to come before these institutions. Uh, and uh, on a final note, uh, on, on kind of the principles, uh, you know, guiding uh, these, it is also important to kind of look at some of the decisions that uh, <clears throat> have been given out by these uh, courts and tribunals and how this has been implemented at the uh, at the state level or at the regional level. And that is also going to be part of this process and this journey. Rebecca, over to you to cover any other points. Um, I think that summarized it wonderfully, Nashan. Um, what we, we do hope that this can be is a cooperative endeavor um, with civil society, with citizens. Um, every citizen is affected by international justice, and not just established NGOs and civil society organizations, as well as, of course, with the legal professionals and um, with the court institutions themselves. Um, we hope here that you will all have ideas about how we may re reach a more diverse array of stakeholders, um, including academia, including the private sector, all of whom have the potential to help us achieve the goals of effectiveness and universality that I'll always keep coming back to. So thank you, Neshan. I, I don't think I have more than that to add. I probably have just one comment to add, and then we'll go on to the principles, which is the next slide, and Neshan's already started talking a bit about that. And it's for, for me, why I came into this, I'm a non-lawyer, but I came into this um, because I saw the value of international judicial institutions to be a balancer of the power imbalance, uh, to be, in a sense, the place where the physically weak, um, in terms of, you know, small countries, uh, communities, you know, not those that are militarily powerful, but here in the international uh, tribunals uh, and courts, uh, everyone's equal under the law. So it actually balances the power. And I've seen, you know, through the cases, particularly in the International Court of Justice, you know, how the smaller countries can bring the issues 
uh, to the court and win against more powerful countries and have a huge impact. Uh, so to me, that's a huge value of the institutions. Um, and having had experience engaging, I was very much involved in the 1994 to 96 Nuclear Weapons Advisory Opinion to see the role that civil society can play in these cases, both in getting cases to the court and in implementation is very much, to me, a part of what how they can be successful. So that's a little reflection of sort of why I'm very much involved in this area of work. Uh, let's go to the next slide, James. Uh, we've already actually started on some of these, um, but maybe Rebecca can then look a little bit more on this to uh, fill in the if there's any gaps that we haven't addressed on the core principles so far. Uh, sure, and I'll just address one question in the chat as well is um, how do civil society organizations become members or participate in the impact coalition? At the moment, we don't have a distinct a distinction between individuals or civil society organizations becoming members. Perhaps this will organically evolve over time, and I think it will be up to our coalition as a whole to determine what that makeup and that, what that architecture looks like. There is no defined framework at present. Um, and that is for um, that that is intentional. Uh, that is so that we can evolve organically together, and that this can truly be a collaborative process. Um, but to speak to the general question about how one, whether an organization or an individual, can become a member of the Impact Coalition, being here today already generates um, or shows us some degree of interest. Um, we'll follow this with um, a a more formal. Um, uh, ask, um, well, we shouldn't say formal, um, but we'll dot our I's and cross our T's that you actually do want to, to be here. There is no commitment whatsoever that is entailed by being a part of this coalition. It is in keeping with, uh, uh, other than perhaps um, adhering to these core principles that uh, we've mostly discussed and maybe can spend a moment or two more on. Um, and uh, so this coalition really is what we make it. Um, and we hope that values such as Emma, um, what you raised before um, about inclusivity um, will be able to be um, realized through the participation of all of our members. So the short answer is we'll send around a survey after this asking if you truly want to be here. There is nothing that you have to do beyond that point. And uh, we'll um, keep you informed of activities, hope you keep us informed of activities and work together to the goals of the coalition. I would say in addition to the um, core principles that we've already discussed about working collaboratively, um, about uh, seeking uh, inclusivity and representation, about being guided by principles of complementarity and co cooperation um, between and among judicial institutions, uh, regional institutions at the uh, international level, regional institutions and domestic institutions. Um, we also, I think, and I've seen several uh, friends and, and mentors on this call um, who have spent their careers um, and um, their avocations um, supporting victims and survivors, vulnerable communities, um, and affected individuals. And I think we always need to have that lens first and foremost in our minds. And so if we can put forward a victim-centric, community-guided, um, gender-sensitive approach um, I, I think we will be well on our way to um, achieving what some of the aspirations of these uh, of the, the judicial architecture have been and have not yet successfully perhaps accomplished to their full potential. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'll add one more thing about inclusivity um, because there's aspects to it and uh, we need to work on the different aspects. But one of those is actually in the scheduling of meetings and events. So this is why we have two sessions uh, for this meeting today. They're basically repeat sessions, one that's timed to enable uh, people from Asia Pacific to participate, and one which is this one, which is more for the Western Hemisphere, the Americas, Europe, Africa, the Middle East. We'll continue to try and do that as much as possible uh, for our program activities. It's not always possible. If we're doing a hybrid event, for example, in New York attached to the UN or in Geneva attached to the UN, that has to be according to the to the time frame there. But for online meetings like this, um, most of them we can do as, as two sessions to employ, and ensure that we have an inclusivity. Okay, should we move on to the next slide? We were actually looking at a bit of timeline uh, and some of the uh, specific, uh, also the practical steps, and then we do the timeline. Um, and there's a question from T Tad Daly in the chat. 
Um, I think it's more oh. of a very welcome, thank you, offer to um, to join as an organizational um, co-sponsor um, or supporting organization. Duly noted, Tad, and thank you for your enthusiasm. Thanks. So now the key recommendations and practical next steps. Uh, so we've already talked a bit about the first one, which is fostering an inclusive and participatory coalition of stakeholders. Uh, willing to engage with ICA and other courts and tribunals. Um, part of this also is, um, as we've been doing in this uh, event, is to provide an opportunity to talk about what are the roles of the tribunals, how do they operate, um, how they can be used effectively, and how we can improve them. Uh, and then, you know, we're wanting to, one of the key areas, which is the recommendation two, uh, is to enhance the universality of the International Court of Justice um, in particular. Uh, this is one that at the moment, uh, for the acceptance of compulsory jurisdiction, uh, there's only 74 countries have done that so far. Now, that's not the only way of taking a case to the International Court of Justice. There are also jurisdiction through treaties and the advisory opinion process. Uh, but what one of the, the, the key aims of this is to, is to build the campaign for uh, universal acceptance of the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, which would be you know, the ultimate objective. Um, but any progress along those ways is going to help. Uh, in terms of building more adherence uh, to legal approaches uh, to resolve these international disputes. Um, then the third recommendation, we've talked a little bit about the Pact for the Future already and the People's Pact for the Future. Um, we're wanting to engage very much in getting a, a strong attention to the important role of judicial institutions in the Pact for the Future. That's the, the, the government adopted document. Uh, in the first draft, there was nothing. <laughs> We've got now something in the second draft, thanks to some of the like-minded countries, thanks to civil society engaging in the consultation process and in, in, in highlighting the importance of judicial institutions. But more could be done. It's still quite weak, the, the comments on the judicial institutions in the Pact for the Future. Uh, so that's one thing, continue to engage in the consultation process. Um, what um, we will get onto also the um, oh, in parallel to what's happening with the pact for the future, we also want to work sort of in a sense parallel to that. And not everything has to be agreed in the pact for the future to make progress. Individual states can sign on to the jurisdiction of the court, can be involved in in uh, taking cases to the court or. Uh, other areas of support for the judicial institutions can be developed through the fact that the UN Summit of the Future is helping us to highlight these things, but it doesn't require having to be in the Pact for the Future. So parallel um, efforts to support the courses, the courts, um, including through work with like-minded states, and we'll come to something specific on that. Um, and what was the last one? Um, oh, a look beyond the Summit of the Future. So those are some of the key approaches that we're looking at taking. Uh, Rebecca. Um, if you'll indulge me just to take a deeper dive in, in a couple of these. Um, firstly, Enid um, in the chat has said uh, per universality, same for ICC, not just ICJ. Absolutely. Um, as somebody who's worked on the universality of uh, the, the ICC through a number of fronts, um, and uh, we are all proud members of the, the coalition for the ICC. That is very much an aim of this coalition, um, and we will continue to be as supportive as we can be. With regards to the ICC, of course, as you well know, Enid, and um, uh, unfortunately many on this call, we also have, and uh, to Tad's point, and I would love to hear your, your question about engagement in the United States, um, we also have to be um, unfortunately alert um, to, to threats, um, particularly in my home jurisdiction. And what I'm referring to, of course, is the passage of H.R. 8282 in the House and the potential that it might come up in the Senate. Um, if any of you um, had the ability to participate in the opening session of the CICC roundtables, which I'm hoping not because it was at 4 a.m., I think, local time um, here on the East Coast, at least, um, you would have heard very sobering remarks by all three of the court's principals about the utterly devastating effect that sanctions would have on the court. We've been here before. 
with individual sanctions placed in 2020. Um, but what is contemplated now with potentially uh, sanctions against on the institution as a whole, depending on how, of course, that's interpreted by the executive, of course, depending on if this passes the Senate, and of course, looking forward to November, depending on what happens there, um, would have the um, effect of ultimately um, not only neutering the institution, not only stopping um, every situation in progress today, but literally opening the jail cells, um, literally stopping protection for victims and witnesses. So when we try to raise um, awareness in the United States, particularly because my organization is a US member based organization, that is our remit, um, we have to dispel and quash um, a lot of misconceptions conceptions and deal with a lot of misinformation when it comes to the International Criminal Court. When it comes to the ICJ and universal jurisdiction um, uh, through declarations of acceptance of compulsory jurisdiction over contentious disputes, we're in a little bit of a different place. The 124 states that have ratified the Rome tra Treaty uh, Rome Statute versus the um, 74 states uh, accepting compulsory jurisdiction we have identified a number of states um, that are not part of the ICJ regime that really there isn't a reason, there is not a political reason, there is not a deeply entrenched, it seems to us at least, and to our colleagues and those with whom we consult, including the member states themselves, um, there, there's not an objection there. In some circumstances, it's small states worrying about resource constraints and worrying about bandwidth. Um, in others, it's simply it's not on their radar. And so this group of like-minded states a few years ago, um, led by Liechtenstein, Romania, Japan, um, others, uh, Norway, I'm not going to get through New Zealand, I think, right, Alan? Did I miss New Zealand? Okay, can't miss New Zealand. Um, uh, had published not only um, a declaration for sign-on for states who were uh, eager to accept compulsory jurisdiction, but a handbook that explained the ICJ and its role. Um, and interestingly, three states that signed a declaration have not accepted compulsory jurisdiction. And that's also because of bureaucratic and administrative reasons in capitals, not, as I say, a lack always of political will. So here where we talk about the universality of the ICJ, and we talk about the universality of the ICC, and we talk about supporting both of these institutions and their independence and protecting their judges and their staff. Um, the, there are similarities and, and there are differences. So I did want to drill down a little bit on that one. And I'm sorry, I've been talking too long, but I also do, you know, with um, some folks on the line that work very hard for new judicial institutions, we have tried to open up that space in the People's Pact for the Future for the contemplation of a World Court of Human Rights or an international anti-corruption court, and that that will not be left um, in a document gathering dust, hopefully once the summit of the future is here and gone, but that that can be something that this coalition can take up, knowing that there are others who are uh, specifically focused on, on those goals that we are complementing um, and hopefully not competing with. Thanks, Rebecca. I think I'll ask James now to go on to the next slide because you started talking about our work, for example, with the like-minded group of countries that are working on uh, building acceptance of the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. So that's one specific um, a program action that we're taking. Um, you've also mentioned a little bit about the support for the ICC. So perhaps we can just go through a little bit now and see what are some of the, the sort of concrete plans of taking this forward? What, how, how might we work with this like-minded group? Uh, you've mentioned there are a number of uh, I, uh, countries that haven't yet accepted the jurisdiction of the ICJ that could be quite open to this. How are we going to reach them? Uh, and we've got some of that listed down here uh, in the provisional timeline. So I think I'll swing back to you again, Rebecca, on this, just to give a little bit of an outline of what are some of these concrete plans. Isn't it Nashan's turn? Nashan, would you like to take this slide? I've been talking quite a bit. It's fine, Rebecca, for you to continue to. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, you're, no, no. you're very sick of hearing the sound of my voice. 
Um, so we are here in June, um, having uh, hopefully with these two sessions convened our first virtual coalition um, and uh, having sensitized at the outset, at least. We didn't expect you to have photographic memories or take screenshots of the provisional work plan. This will all be shared with you again. It has been shared in the lead up to this call, um, but we hope you will be able to offer substantive commentary hereafter, having been formed, of course, back in May in Nairobi. Um, we hope to meet on a monthly basis, uh, again, in multiple time zones. My, my commitment demonstrated by the 1am, which I'll keep mentioning, um, uh, over the course of the next several months in the short time, the, the very short runway we have before the summit of the future. Um, and thereafter, can reevaluate if monthly meetings um, are appropriate um, uh, junctures at which we continue to regroup. Um, in September, um, uh, long signed the Summit of the Future are so-called civil society action days. And so over the next few months, we will be contemplating how this coalition in co close cooperation with other coalitions um, seeks to use those action days to full advantage. Because they are literally abutting the Summit of the Future, um, this isn't the time, I think, to look for things to get into the Pact for the Future. It's probably not the time to envision that commitments will be made by member states. It might not even be the time to sit down with permanent representatives, um, given the fact that they will be caught up in their own state negotiations. So how do we use that time effectively? And we will come back, I hope, to Tad's question. One of that, one of those ways uh, may be to raise public engagement and awareness and have that be a calling card um, for member states about um, the interest, not only in the typical civil society actors, the usual suspects, but a wider array of individuals and stakeholders um, in the success of these institutions and the realization of the promise um, of 1899 and 1945 and 1998. Um, once the summit of the future is behind us, we think we will regroup and as a coalition decide how we would like to be constituted, um, maybe come up with some specific work planning, maybe look towards joint fundraising if there are concrete activities that we want to undertake that demand resources that are not supported otherwise. And so um, this might be a formal organizational structure. Um, it might um, be looser. And I think it really is um, up to us collectively um, to decide what that might look like. So that's all we have in terms of our provisional timeline from now through the first quarter um, of FY 2025. Um, I, I, sorry, I use the, the US um, uh, fiscal year. So that is October to December. Um, I realize that's probably not the best way to frame this um, in terms of being inclusive of folks from other regions. And I will rewrite this slide for next time. I think that's it for me, Alan. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, just was there anything more on the plans for the hybrid event with the like-minded states? Uh, so we're looking at doing this in New York, uh, probably not inside the UN, but I think we've got the possibility of doing it either at the Baha'i International uh, Community Center or at one of the missions of the one of the like-minded states. Um, but can you say a little bit more about that? Is this something which we're, we're getting a little bit more on track with where, when we might be able to do it and how we might be able to pull that together? Because this hybrid event is something which I, I expect we'll be able to um, in, uh, invite member states to come there in person uh, in New York, but also others to participate online from around the world. Uh, yes, so we have had very positive conversations with um, a few of the like-minded states, and particular, particularly Liechtenstein and Romania are interested in collaborating on a co-hosted event um, of the nature Alan um, mentioned. Um, Romania in particular uh, is in, uh, has a history already with the legal alternatives to war campaign um, that um, is very complementary on the universality of the ICJ that is very complementary to this coalition. Uh, the then permanent representative spoke at our launch event last, uh, last October and is now a sitting judge at the International Court of Justice. Um, there has been a proposal that this could be around International Justice Week or International Justice Day, which is July 17th. These are upcoming um, and also uh, coincide with the high level political forum this year. 
Um, so this will be a little bit of a, uh, a technical logistical challenge to pull off in time, practical challenge. Um, but if not then, uh, shortly thereafter, certainly before the summit of the future, we hope to have this event co-hosted with like-minded states, targeting states that have not accepted jurisdiction um, and that are, are open to exploring that. Um, and we have a few in mind. And I see a raised hand from Cyril. Yeah, Cyril, welcome. You have a question or comment. Yeah, uh, introduce sure yourself, to, Cyril. I'm Cyril Ritchie, the first uh, vice president of, of Congo, the Conference of UN NGOs, and president of the Union of International Associations. Uh, just to, uh, two small questions. Uh, would you give us more uh, ideas and clues as to what you're thinking of doing on the action days? This is going to be in a terribly intense period the two action days are 20 and 21, so that's immediately before the summit. And everybody is going to be uh, very, very, very deeply involved in a whole range of activities. So what, what is it you have in mind and how, how will that be prepared? Uh, one tiny remark, uh, Rebecca mentioned that she was at the moment working on the US fiscal year. Why don't we just stick with the calendar year, which is pretty well universal? that the first quarter of U.S. fiscal year becomes the last quarter of 2024, and more people will understand that, I suspect. Thank you. Uh, Cyril, I completely agree with you on the latter point. Um, please forgive me. I think this was probably coming out of a budget that I was doing at the time. Uh, easy change. <laughs> Alan, do you want to take the first part? We've been discussing this a lot. Yeah, so with regards to the um, action days, um, as Cyril, Cyril's quite correct. It's immediately before the summit of the future. Uh, governments will have already decided, you know, what their positions are going to be. The draft pact, the pact for the future will basically be decided. So there's not much influence that the action days could have on what the governments are agreeing at the summit of the future. It might have a little influence on what they elevate a little bit more than others in their presentations, but probably not, because they've probably already got their speeches <laughs> arranged also. And it's also, it's a high level week, um, or the high level period of the UN. So the governments are so busy, not just on the summit of the future, but on a whole lot else, which is happening, in, including bilaterals and many other things. So what we're thinking more is that we're probably going to have more possibility to have cross-fertilization of civil society in those action days so that we can engage with other impact coalitions. We can elevate what things are coming out of here that we can take forward. We'll have an idea. This is what's in the pact for the future. This is where traction is building and, and use it as a way of really looking at what we do after the, the gavel comes down at the end of the summit of the future you know, that we're ready to run with what, what's come out of it in the way that we want to run with it, you know, which will be a progressive way of running with it. So I think that's the way we're talking about how we will use those action days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nishan, you had something to add? No, very quickly, uh, Alan, uh, just would be wonderful to kind of hear views from those who are engaged in this dialogue. Uh, one of the challenges that, you know, uh, will be that the majority of those who are in Nairobi and the majority of possibly those who are on this call will not be in person in New York and they will not even get visas to enter the United States for leave alone participate in a New York meeting of the UN. Then the real question of how is it then civil society going to engage in this process as there's a number of activities leading up to the summit of the future and Rebecca and Alan also mentioned what's going to happen after the summit of the future but it'd be good to see what kind of uh, information or ideas that this group has to continue this uh, engagement, uh, both ahead of the summit of the future, taking point of what Cyril said, but uh, during the conference in New York, but thereafter, knowing that most of us will not be in New York. Um, 
Yes, and just to add one um, concrete and um, hopefully fully transparent point, one of the other uh, windows open on my browser right now um, is a proposal that we've been working on with some of the other impact coalitions, how we can come together knowing that this space will be incredibly crowded, that it will be cacophonous. Um, and do we join forces? Does that dilute the um, uh, effectiveness or the messaging of any one coalition? Um, given the limited space, given the um, very uh, uh, scarce real estate, both figurative and very literal. Um, I think we have decided that the common approach uh, is uh, perhaps the most constructive for all of us. And so we would love to feed this uh, process back to the coalition members um, of this coalition and others as we seek to join forces uh, for the greater good. Thanks, Rebecca and Nishan. Um, Moving on to the next part, which is other opportunities uh, and for taking forward the objectives in the impact coalition that are arising. Um, and so we can leave the slide on or we can go to the next slide. But one example um, and which we're active on is the non-proliferation treaty PREPCOM, which is the nuclear non-proliferation where governments are meeting for two weeks in Geneva. Um, so we're taking to them you know, the calls to uh, to uh, support universal jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, for example, to increase you know their the use of uh, law rather than war for the approach to international conflicts. And there are two uh, sign-on statements uh, that that are f uh, in preparation for this. One is for parliamentarians, and I'll just put them in the chat now. Um, and the other one is for interfaith uh, individuals, communities, or organizations. And both of these uh, have their principal call of increasing the acceptance of the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice um, and solving international conflicts uh, through, through peace and law, not through the threat of nuclear weapons and war. Uh, so this is one way of building you know, uh, traction uh, behind these proposals through other uh, forums that are happening, and we welcome your ideas of other forums where this can be taken to, whether it be through statements, whether it be through side events, workshops, we will be doing side events also in Geneva during the NPT PrepCom, for example. And um, before going to Tad and hopefully queuing up Tad, um, if, if we're uh, as linked up as I hope we are, um, these advocacy resources, of course, can have um, a, a general direction and can have uh, techniques, tactics, strategies, information and background on the institutions. And they also will benefit from tailoring to every specific context. I've been talking a lot about mine, and I hope um, we can hear from Tad and some of your ideas about how to reach out in the United States um, with regards to not only the ICC, the ICJ, but these other ideas um, and uh, the uh, some of the perhaps less understood aspects of our international or global judicial ecosystem. Um, and we also would love to to hear from you um, not only what resources you would benefit from and what advocacy actions you will take. Um, but how your conversations are going, what you're hearing on the ground. Um, all of us uh, have different constituencies, whether that be in your capitals, whether that be um, in your networks. And uh, without having that kind of flow of information, the, the goals, the ambitious goals of a coalition like ours um, are perhaps um, uh, not thwarted, made all the more challenging to achieve. Um, so Tad, over to you. Hi, folks. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Good. Yes, I don't know can. if you want to turn my camera on. That's not hugely important, but uh, here I go. First um, first of all, thank you, you all. Uh, it's really good to be here. This is very impressive. Um, just the level of detail and engagement, both of, you know, it's easy to just say, let's support the ICC, let's support the ICJ. But uh, you all with this impact coalition are going into a great deal more detail, both about what goes on at those uh, institutions and about uh, public engagement, which is what my question uh, is about. Uh, you know, Rebecca and uh, Alan, I know you pretty well, and I think you know that 
most of my public advocacy is directed at preaching beyond the choir and trying to get these conversations out beyond our own small, narrow circles. So with all that preamble, and this is a little unfair of me to just kind of uh, uh, pop this on you, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, I just want to ask, there's a pres presidential debate in two days. Donald Trump versus uh, Joe Biden. And I've watched a lot of these over the years. I've been in the room for a couple. And often they uh, they go to the audience and, um, and they ask the audience to ask a question. So if that were hypothetically to happen to, to, to one of you or, you know, whoever wants to take this on, an opportunity not only to speak about the judicial, the international judicial ecosystem uh, to the two leading presidential candidates, but also to about 50 million Americans. If you had that opportunity, what would you say? Sorry, I think it's you again, Rebecca. So you're, you, coming from the United States, uh, will probably be aware Not necessarily, of... Alan Ware. You know American politics pretty well. But, but let's, let's throw, the, throw the question to Rebecca, and I'll come back on another part of what you said, Tad, because I've got some reflections on the other aspect of what you said. Rebecca? Thank you. Um, uh, thanks so much, Tad, uh, for the question. And it is a difficult one, and I probably will not have the answer that that you like, but I'm going to speak solely from a personal perspective, not on behalf of my organization, CGS, and certainly not on behalf of this impact coalition. Um, I would take the stance of discretion is the better part of valor if asked to, uh, to um, if given the opportunity to ask a question at the presidential debate. And the reason, and this has been discussed um, within the Washington Working Group for the ICC and in other fora, is that while you have the opportunity to speak to 50 million Americans, you also have a, um, a the, it also comes with a risk um, of raising this on the radar uh, of um, two uh, presidential candidates, one of whom uh, the position is well known, um, uh, against the ICC and against multilateralism more generally, and one of whom has his back against the wall in some uh, senses, uh, particularly if the Senate vote was to go in the direction that we don't anticipate that it will go. And so therefore advocacy, when it comes to the executive, when it comes to the legislature, has been um, of a more um, uh, tactical, behind the scenes sort of nature. That said, I agree with you wholeheartedly that we need to reach uh, the Vox Populi. We need to reach um, uh, across the United States. And that is the goal um, of my organization, our organization, as you are um, a chapter leader, a longtime member, been part of this movement far longer than, than I, um, not, to, not to age you, Tad. <laughs> um, but we have a number of mechanisms to do that. Um, one, and I can give you some concrete examples. Um, this week, hopefully, we will put out through our op-ed service um, a short piece um, condemning the sanctions uh, or threat of sanctions against the ICC. Uh, through our journal, we recently published a piece by Ambassador David Sheffer, along with your wonderful piece. Um, Ambassador David Sheffer was the first at that time styled ambassador at large uh, for war crimes now uh, styled ambassador uh, at large for global criminal justice and signed his name to the Rome statute on behalf of the United States that of course we never ratified. Um, David's article was the United States must ratify the Rome statute. I'll be traveling with him this week, uh, toward the end of this week, uh, to a small town in Massachusetts to hold a community conversation about America's place in the world and the world's place in America. And one of the, the facets of that conversation will, of course, be the ICC and the, the uh, global judicial architecture more broadly and why it is of paramount importance that the United States um, uh, play a visceral role, uh, sorry, an integral role um, We've had we've had the great fortune over the this administration to have some very key allies um, within the State Department um, who have done what they can um, and have done more probably behind the scenes than some of us know. Uh, we've been privileged to have some uh, candid discussions, but there's probably a, a level of candor that cannot be reached, um, that cannot be breached rather. Um, and um, we have been thrilled to see the, the United States cooperate with court 
um, selectively and not thrilled about the selectivity. Um, so to answer, I hope that answers your question about a, a strategic approach to advocacy in the United States in support of the, um, of the ICC in particular, but of this whole project generally. There are some on this call who could answer this much better than I. Um, and then also to your question about how to reach um, a more, uh, how to reach the public, how to reach citizens at large. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I see Emma's hands up, uh, but just before going to Emma, uh, I've got a reflection on the other point that Tad made, and then maybe Nisha may want to have a reflection as well. And that is where, Tad, you mentioned the importance of going outside into the broader community in order to take the ideas of the importance of judicial institutions. You know, and I think we mentioned this right at the beginning. You know, this is not just for the lawyers and the policymakers. Uh, this is something which we as the broader civil society need to see as relevant. And that's part of not just from us, the conveners here, but we throw back to everybody who's participating in the Impact Coalition. What are the organizations? What are the movements? What are the um, meetings, events, assemblies that you're participating in? If it's a human rights, there's a role for judicial institutions. If it's environment, there's a role for the judicial instru uh, institutions. Um, Nishan's already given an example, for example, you know, of the climate case in the International Court of Justice, which is so important uh, to the climate issue. So engaging and, and taking the importance of the judicial institutions, the International Court of Justice, International Criminal Court, plus the proposal for an international anti-corruption court, for example, uh, there's also a proposal for an international court on the environment. You know, these are relevant to the, the, the organizations, the networks, the events that we're involved in. So we encourage you to think creatively about taking it forward. And I said, I gave an example of how we're taking this into the non-proliferation treaty conference, which on the surface is just about nuclear weapons, but really is about peace and security. And so we can open up the debate and engage with governments in that UN conference over two weeks that we're going to be in Geneva. I encourage you to think of the same and then come back to us if we can help you. If you've got an event that's coming up, if you're part of a, a forum, whether it's civil society or intergovernmental, and you want to take forward some of this, we can help you, you know, perhaps frame it or with, with speakers. Uh, uh, so please think creatively and we'll, we want to work together on taking this as broad as we can. Okay, Rebecca's got something to say, maybe Nisha, and then I'll go to Emma. Rebecca? Uh, thanks. I am um, uh, before we we come back to Emma because um, Emma has spoken a little bit. I just wanted to highlight some of the comments and, and questions in the chat. Um, firstly, I, I wanted to um, acknowledge Joseph's concern um, about not having interpretation or translation at this meeting or indeed um, our meeting last night. We absolutely understand that one can't talk the talk of inclusivity without walking the walk and having um, such facilities available. This is all pro bono. And unfortunately, you're uh, you're dealing with one monolinguists or very close to, um, and we we currently do not have um, volunteer capacity uh, to uh, have translation into all of these six UN languages or in fact any languages that might be um, uh, of uh, um, of necessity, especially those, um, for example, in situation countries that are not covered by the six uh, UN languages. And here is where we we really hope that as a coalition we can come together um, and and have one another's backs. Um, Katie Gallagher also reminded that when I spoke about the potential risks or uh, dangers of um, raising the the bugaboo of uh, in ICC. Uh, to uh, President Biden and former President Trump, that the ICJ also has been under threat um, and with the administration speaking out against the proceedings brought by South Africa. Um, I, I will I will stop there. Um, oh, uh, John, I'll I'll get back to you in a minute. Okay, sorry. Um, back to you, Alan. Well, I'll go to Nishan, but also there is a question from Vernita that Nishan, you might want to address. How does the coalition define the term universality? for the purpose of its work, given the diverse definitions and understandings that generally prevail. We've used the term universality a few times. Uh, perhaps you might want to address that and if you've got any other comments also, Nishan. Thanks, Alan. I think, uh, yeah, this uh, requires a, a separate discussion. I think this is an important point that uh, Ted has raised. Uh, but on the, uh, the question on uh, 
what you mentioned that international law is not just for international lawyers, but for the wider, uh, you know, citizens. I think that's one of the key cornerstones that needs to be realized that we are in a really a massive shift uh, or transition at the start of this century. And, and there's a new international law which is being born out of this. And that is really on comparative uh, developments, uh, including the examples that we highlighted about young people from the Pacific Islands, build on cooperation and solidarity. And that itself will be the future of this century if we are to survive the century. And this is again for the wider uh, political uh, components who are <clears throat> striving to for political office because almost close to 4 billion people will be voting uh, or has voted already uh, in other parts of the world or will be voting in the next 12 months. Uh, that needs to consider whether which part of uh, history that uh, we want to be uh, on. And this is why international law plays a key uh, uh, facility. And then from the learning of those who have adjudicated, who has pioneered this quarter of a century ago, kind of making uh, uh, the space for the 21st century international law to come through, including Vera Mantri and others at the, at the, at the International Court of Justice, is looking at this interconnectedness of all peoples on one planet. And I think that's where the transformation is taking place. And if we lose sight of that, we are the <clears throat> one species on the planet that's going to lose out on. And that's uh, saying a lot uh, in, in a short space of time. And on universality, and I think this is you know, uh, the quick answer to, to this is, uh, which was mentioned by Alan, that uh, the for International Court of Justice, we had a situation of where only 74 countries uh, have signed on to the compulsory jurisdiction of this court. Uh, now, we should not uh, uh, take International Court of Justice alone, uh, although it is the uh, only UN organ uh, within the institution set out, whereas International Criminal Court, the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea is uh, not uh, an organ of the United Nations, but independent thereof. But we need to consider the fact that Tribunal of the Law of the Sea has 169 member states signed on to the Convention of the Law of the Sea. And as Rebecca mentioned, 124 countries have signed on to the uh, Rome Statute. But we need to use this advocacy to push the other member states to sign up to the compulsory jurisdiction of the uh, universe uh, or the, of the International Court of Justice. Uh, and uh, one other development also is that if you look at the last 15 to 20 years, or even the current dossier of the International Court of Justice, there's the, you know close to 22 cases with almost two thirds of the members of the United Nations already appearing directly or intervening in any number of those 22 cases, which is an opportunity to bring back this uh, momentum on universality. Saying that there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and I think um, this is where the coalition, especially using different cultural norms, including different languages, need to inform this discourse. I think Emma is still waiting. Thanks. Okay, so uh, Emma, you've got your hand up. You've got another question or comment. Uh, can you unmute yourself, Emma? Yes, I was talking on mute. I was going to say, I did want to take up time for others who have not spoken, because there's some really interesting conversations going on. But my question, um, the, the timing has, has, has lost some of its value. It stemmed from um, the speaker who put out the challenge, if you're in a room with the president, and the debates are going on. Um, the comment that came to my mind was to, to share uh, that a reform at the United Nations question directed to these big leaders around the world would really be around the United States taking a leadership role to champion the cause for reform at the highest organs of the in an international bodies like the United Nations. Because a lot of that, a lot of what we're discussing here from my vantage point flows from having that restructuring um, at some of the highest levels of the world bodies who are tasked with peace and security, which uh, issues of justice flow from. So the international framework for peace and security really does not, it's not set up to address some of the challenges we face. And that was the question that if I had the opportunity, I could not miss uh, 
the chance uh, when that challenge was posed uh, to make that comment. So thank you for allowing me to speak again. Sorry, I click off. Thank you, Emma. Just a quick response to that. Um, as Rebecca mentioned at the beginning, we're one of 20 impact coalitions. Um, and there are other impact coalitions which are taking forward more. The, um, the United Nations reform, for example, there is actually an impact coalition on UN reform. And that's with a strong focus on the Security Council, uh, but also on some of the other bodies. Uh, in this impact coalition, we're focusing on the judicial institutions. So, of course, we're also looking at, at some reform and improvement of those. But I think you're asking a slightly different question, which is more to do with reform, for example, of the Security Council. Um, so part of what we're also doing with the impact coalitions is having uh, some cross-fertilization meetings. We had a joint meeting of a number of the impact coalitions. Uh, was it last Thursday, I think, if I remember correctly? Um, and we're just trying to keep track of all the, the, the meeting we're having. And it was very useful for us to share what we're doing with the Impact Coalition on the judicial institutions and the, the one of the co-conveners of the Impact Coalition on the uh, UN reform was mentioning, you know, what they're doing and to see where there can be um, mutual support and cross-fertilization. Yeah. Rebecca, you had a comment also? Um, I do, and um, thank you, Emma, for for your your provocative remarks. And I'm sorry that this might actually be. Uh, and I'm glad that we still have a little bit more time that we don't end on what might be a pessimistic note. But I'll give you an anecdote that I think actually illustrates the intersectionality of of UN reform with our enterprise here on supporting judicial institutions. I was at um, a uh, a discussion last fall on the new agenda for peace, um, and it was held at the, uh, the Swiss Embassy here in Washington, D.C., with the participation of several ambassadors, um, as well as one of the deputy permanent representatives to the United Nations, ambassadors to the United Nations from the United States, um, who held forth on how proud she was, uh, and we are, um, as an administration, of having been so restrained in our use of the veto over the last decades, along with those others who have veto power. That evening, she went into a conversation, a closed con a Security Council conversation, and what has emerged, I think we are all very aware of, of the use. And I will say from, once again, speaking from a personal perspective, of course, abuse of the veto power. Where this comes intersectional, uh, where this intersects with the enterprise that we have here of international judicial institutions is the a notion that accountability um, will be thwarted and that impunity um, for atrocities will be aided um, by the use and abuse of veto, um, as well as uh, there are other mechanisms, of course, that you can uh, take exception with, not only at the Security Council, but at the General Assembly level as well. And here there's been important work that has been furthered um, by like-minded states, supported by, by some of our friends within the legal community. For example, the initiative um, 76262, General Assembly Resolution 76262, which now demands that there is a General Assembly discussion um, uh, in the event of a veto's use. There's also the proposal posited by Liechtenstein that a veto not be used in cases of atrocities. Um, and this is something uh, one of our friends has really worked on um, quite closely and very much aligns with the, uh, the core goals of international criminal justice. Um, and then thirdly, the uh, working group on accountability, conduct and transparency uh, has also tried to further initiatives to um, realize what is already um, enshrined um, in the UN Charter that parties to a conflict not use the veto. None of this is getting to the, the big kahuna, so to speak, of eliminating the veto altogether. Um, but these are steps that are being taken uh, in the interest, I would say, of international criminal justice in particular. Thank you. Now, I just saw, and thank you, John Vlasto, who put in the chat the link to, uh, to the convener for the uh, Impact Coalition on UN Reform. Uh, thanks for that, John. So look in the chat for that. Um, 
And John has also just put in a message um, on uh, planetary environment and reform. And I'd already put in the chat the link to the Earth Governance uh, Impact Coalition. I could put it in again if you want. And I've mentioned the intersections between this Impact Coalition and that one with regards to the judicial institutions that the Earth Governance uh, Impact Coalition is also advancing. Uh, as we're coming towards the end of this, I'll ask James to go on to the final slide. Um, and again, this is just to ensure that you've got like the links to uh, the online resources that we have already. If we can go to the final slide. Uh, and then just a mention also that I believe that Citizens for Global Solutions will also be hosting a web page for this impact coalition. Is that correct, Rebecca? Yes, thank you, Drea, very much for putting that into, um, into action. Uh, we will follow when we follow up with our thank yous for this session with links to that page. Yeah, we're not getting the final slide. Oh, oh, there we go. Thank you so much. Uh, so there we already have um, our web page of Global Solutions. Citizens for Global Solutions hosts a web page for Law Not War, which is mentioned as, as, as a, a, a part of the Impact Coalition. That's the one focusing uh, primarily on the International Court of Justice. There's also the link for the Coalition for the International Criminal Court. And we'll put in there the link to uh, follow the cases before the International Court of Justice. Um, and as, as we mentioned, there will also be at some stage soon uh, Citizens for Global Solutions hosting a page for the Impact Coalition where we will upload resources and other things so that you've got access to that. I think we're coming near the end. Rebecca, you've got something else there? Uh, yes, well, Enid has her hand up, but I also just want to highlight when we follow up from this meeting, in addition to the resources that we've shared with you um, and, and curated and that will continue to grow, thank you so much for all of those who have been putting resources and perspective in the chat. Um, and with your kind permission, we would like to share that with the community as well. Um, there are many interesting perspectives here. Uh, there are many initiatives to follow. Um, and we hope that this can be a space for connecting amongst ourselves as well as furthering this coalition. Um, but I saw that Enid also had her hand up. Maybe it's been taken down now. I'm not sure, Enid, if you could still want to speak. Should we give Enid permission to speak? Technical visit permission? Uh, you now have it, Enid. Am, am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Okay, right. Okay, as I've been listening to all of this, and uh, Rebecca knows well, I've been involved with the ICC representing various bar associations, including Philadelphia, uh, since it was created in 1998. And I'm listening to what you're saying, and I think one of the things I've learned is that when you're talking to people, you really need to clearly note all of these different institutions and what they are and what they stand for, because people have no clue. And so you're talking about many different institutions other than what you're, what you're projecting here, what you're deciding. Um, and I, I guess it would be helpful, it certainly would be to me, you talked about the impact coalition, you talked about other things, what in the world is are they all doing? And is it not possible that there's a lot of, of overlap among them all? So why are we creating another another group? How I, I, it's still not clear to me what what the bottom line is here in terms of exactly what this coalition will be doing, what others have been doing, what this coalition, the need for this coalition, 
over what some of the others have been. Uh, I mean, I know some of the actors you're talking about, the, um, you know, Liechtenstein is very involved with the veto at the uh, Security Council. That's Jennifer Trahan has written a very colleague of mine, very informative book from a legal perspective on that. On that, um, I mean, that, that's just what I'm thinking as I'm listening to you. Because I know when I speak, if I don't tell the difference, I'm, what the differences are between the different courts, the ICJ, the ICC, the um, courts for U Yugoslavia and um, Rwanda, people have no clue what you're talking about. So that's that's just how do we avoid the confusion? I guess that's my bottom line. And and why? You know why why we why we need this group versus what's can can we just come under one umbrella? Is this even possible? So my 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 thoughts. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Enid. Um, I'll give a quick response, reflection, um, and the others might want to look at it also. One is on what are these institutions? And today we only had time to give a very brief introduction to these different judicial institutions. Um, with Law Not War, we've, do it going, we've been going into more depth on the role of the International Court of Justice. Uh, and if you want to sign up for Law Not War, you'll be getting updates on the different court cases, you know, what, how does the International Court of Justice work, um, wh why these cases are important, and what are a lot of the success stories and the impact that they've had. Uh, the Coalition for the ICC, International Criminal Court, is doing the same in terms of uh, cases in the International Criminal Court. Uh, and what we've been looking at is trying to get more of an overview and it's only been very brief today. So one of the things we've been thinking is maybe we it would be useful for us to do an education webinar, which is going through the different judicial institutions in more depth, um, and just do that. Just look at a little bit more at the ICC, the International Court of Justice, and uh, at LOS, you know, International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, and have a bit of a comparison between those so that people know a little bit more about these judicial institutions. So I think what you've been saying is that may be something that's quite useful. Um, on the other thing, we are cooperating. That's the whole idea of the summit of the future um, the, is actually to look at the intersection of these different processes uh, and the different aspects, the different... Um, and so that's with the impact coalitions, they may be focusing on something different, like the uh, Earth Governance Impact Coalition is focusing on environmental issues and how to take that forward. The Impact Coalition on the International Anti-Corruption Court is like, how do we address corruption? Uh, this one is on, of course, the judicial institutions. The one on uh, the UN reform is looking at UN reform. So they've got a focus on specific processes or specific aspects of these, but we're also looking at cooperating together. And we did that, a lot of intersection at the Nairobi conference itself. We're having meetings of the impact coalitions, but also the People's Pact of the Future is bringing a lot of those together and seeing how they work together and the intersection. So that's my reflection, but I think. You're on not the just talking about you, so but you're not just talking about judicial institutions, are yes. you? Oh, all right, because this impact you, you coalition talked about is involving on... a lot of people who are not necessarily part of the legal community. And you're I'll pass on to, to someone else to explain. Rebecca or Nishan? I think Nishan was was nodding a lot, and then I'll I'll come and bring up the caboose. <laughs> And also, Neshan, I think this is a point that you you uh, take very well. No, thank you, Anita. I, I <clears throat> agree that it has to have uh, you know remnants of clarity. Uh, now, as mentioned, that uh, this coalition working on just institutions on the International Court of Justice is part of a wider group of coalitions that have been put together at the Nairobi conference, as explained by Alan, uh, to lobby for a specific aspect of the outcome of the UN Summit of the Future happening in September. Now, uh, what happens thereafter with this coalition, 
uh, and Alan mentioned, for example, the Law Not War campaign, which is specifically looking at the International Court of Justice, and uh, Rebecca mentioned the Working Group <clears throat> uh, on the International Criminal Court, will take this effort beyond the summit of the future as well. So that's where uh, one uh, uh, will then have another opportunity to unpack uh, some of these uh, questions a bit more uh, in, in, in a deeper sense. Uh, and uh, just to reiterate what Alan said, that the outcome, for example, uh, the chapter two of the People's Pact that Rebecca and Alan <clears throat> were involved in putting together uh, on peace and security, which includes just institutions, International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, and the newer models that have been put up there also cuts across uh, other uh, recommendations of, of the People's Pact. So I think that's one other key element which uh, we are lobbying for so that the intergovernmental process at the UN Summit of the Future, which is really led by the German government and the Namibian government when it comes to the Pact for the Future, the Dutch government and the um, Jamaican government who's working on the uh, Declaration on Future Generations, which is one of the key annexes to the Pact for the Future. And finally, uh, the Global Digital Compact, which will be another annex to the, uh, to the Pact for the Future, which is being coordinated between the Swedish government and the Zambian government. So whilst the intergovernmental process will continue to go on and uh, this information is available online, which we, which we will share, the wider civil society groups have been cooperating. And of course, against many odds, including lack of resources and funding so forth, but there's been an incredible effort so far. Uh, but the uh, challenge will remain what not only happens in New York in, in, New, uh, in, in September, but what happens beyond that as well. So I think I will leave it at that, uh, but happy to you know continue this discussion with your input as we proceed. Rebecca? Yes, I'll just give a very brief and, and personalized response to, to Enid about what the unique value add of this coalition is. Another coalition, coalition fatigue. Um, number one, you'll see in the chat that one of the, the other participants, uh, Mr. Peterson, has lost touch with you and would like to reconnect. That is the kind of connection that we would like to see through this coalition. And number two, just another anecdotal example. This morning, um, I well, if you can say, I began my day um, uh, at 8.30 with a, um, a discussion of uh, the road to the, the, the summit of the future. And there is very little overlap between the audience or the participants that I saw there. There is, I know who you are, I see you. <laughs> um, and those who are here and those who are also engaged in coalitions like the Coalition for the ICC. Um, and are working um, on international judicial institutions. When we saw the zero draft of the Pact for the Future, the word court wasn't mentioned. Rule of law was only given the most cursory glazing over um, and international justice was uh, almost woefully absent. That has improved in, in the version one and we hope it will improve more um, with a little bit of goading. Um, but what I was seeing is that at least from my very particular standpoint, I was kind of straddling these two worlds of one working on these UN reform processes and one working with all our friends who support the judicial institutions already, um, are in legal communities, our civil society activists, um, and are, are clued in. Um, and so the thought was how working with other coalitions intersectionally, especially, um, that are emerging out of the Summit of the Future process, we can enrich what's already been happening over decades, um, and that many of you have been involved in, um, to not only establish, um, but as I say, uh, to help achieve the full potential and mandate of current and potentially future judicial institutions. And so that's why I think this coalition it has a unique value add, and I agree with you completely that there is a necessity to distinguish very um are uh, articulate very specifically um what each of these institutions are um and now that some of them are in the news more than ever the icc and the icj in particular um with uh cases um around similar geographical uh jurisdictions but with very different uh jurisdictions in terms of subject matter um 
this this um, informational role, this uh, role of dispelling um, uh, and quashing misinformation, I think could not be more important. And so I think this is hopefully what this humble coalition can strive to do. Thank you very much. And just before we close, I did want to just address Judith Han's uh, question that was in the chat about why not we just all come together and have a global peace system. And I said, wonderful vision. That's actually the vision of my organization, World Federalist Movement. You know, the global peace system would be a proper world government. Um, that's very ambitious. Uh, we put it forward. We've got lots of discussion about how that would work. It's, very, it's guiding a lot of the work that we're doing and building better global governance at the moment. It's a big stretch. It's too far for what the governments are prepared to do at the moment, but we're holding out that vision. And we welcome further conversation on that idea of what would be an even better global system, You know, building so much more on what we've got at the moment, but having even more pr progressive change. Um, that will be, that's part of the ongoing conversation. Um, and these are ideas and comments are all really, really valuable and really good to feed into this. Um, you know, we've got different time spans of how we're taking forward some of these ideas. You know, some of them are smaller incremental steps that can happen sooner. Others are bigger picture, which will take a little bit longer and they can work cooperatively together. One's not in opposition to the other. So I want to say thank you to everybody who's asked questions or put forward ideas. They're all valuable. Um, now, sometimes we may say, well, in this impact coalition, we'll take this is more appropriate to take forward this aspect, you know, the, the courts and the uh, tribunals. There are other related impact coalitions to take forward others that we are cooperating with. So not everything will happen in this space for the dialogue, but we're participating in the other spaces. And so all as everything that you're bringing forward is very um, is, is welcome. We thank you so much for your participation. Uh, we look forward to the continuing participation. We will be uh, contacting you with further questions, ideas, resources, and hopefully we can continue the engagement. And we look forward to seeing you at the range of events that will be taking place. Uh, that's all from me. Any final comment from Rebecca and Nation? Um, only that we were so pleased that so many of you have joined us today. So many of you um, raised comments in the chat. Uh, and some of you, uh, we were lucky enough to hear your voices. But as um, we send more materials or as you just live with this conversation and think about it and ruminate and also um, have your own activities that are moving forward, we hope that this will be an open space for discussion, um, not just in monthly meetings, um, but through the, the coalition um, mechanism itself. So for anyone who didn't um, speak up today uh, or who anyone, anyone who didn't uh, feel heard or get an answer to their question, please come back to us. Please continue the conversation online and we look forward to hopefully seeing you next time. And then for there's one last question from Ch Cheryl Spencer. Uh, and yes, we can save the chat. We've recorded this for the members of the coalition. Um, and I think we have a version of the recording that includes both the, the spoken visual and also the chat there. So that will be available to everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your morning, afternoon, night, or whatever it is. And we look forward to continuing in conversation with you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.